happens. I learned that no matter how right you think you are, it's the way you the message comes across and who you're explaining it to. This episode is brought to you by the best-selling book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a money-making business. Learn more at filmbizbook.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Chris DeBeck. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing well, thank you. Thanks so much for coming on the show, man. We've recently hooked up here in uh, in Austin. There's a, it's a small but powerful film community down here, and we and all us uh, LAers or people who've worked in Hollywood, we it kind of it's a gravitational pull that we just get <laughs> <laughs> brought to each other at one point or another. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel it. You know, I uh, I have a business partner here in Austin, and I. Mm-hmm. Uh, He's the one who convinced me to come on out. So uh, back in, I guess it was November of last year, I did my own life scout, I want to call it. And mm-hmm. I came out for a week, uh, met a lot of people, stayed at two different hotels, was looking at places. I really enjoyed it. And then I went back to LA, did some more work. And then back uh, towards the end of December, came back out, signed a lease, uh, rental. And uh, I'm here. I got here January 7th of 2022 um yeah. and here we are you you uh you, i was ahead of you by about five months so oh my god okay <laughs> not so you're that much new I, too <laughs> i'm i'm here but i've been here just a little bit over a year now and i love it i mean i love it in austin and and i've met a lot of people in the film community here it's very passionate uh film community and and uh everybody really does know everybody <laughs> Down yeah here. tell me about it i uh you know um uh, I, my business partner is a uh, cybersecurity. He's like one of the top, the global hackers in the world. Mm-hmm. And we, uh, he basically invited me out. He goes to the gun range. He goes to the the range at Austin. Mm-hmm. And I swear to God, it's Soho house with guns. It's awesome. <laughs> it's um, Soho house with guns. Soho house with guns. Every Friday afternoon around one o'clock, you can find Robert and his associates. I show up. And then we just take meetings. Uh, Colby Gaines is a local producer here. He came out. We had multiple meetings with him. Uh, I, got, I mean, apparently, I got to go out to this range. You got to go to the yeah. I mean, it's the perfect networking you know situation. It, you don't have to shoot anything. You don't even have to light guns to go there. It just it's a it's just a social environment. That's all. See, you learn something new every day here in Austin. So, Chris, I mean, you've had a hell of a career, my friend, so far, and uh, you know, I wanted to go back deep down the rabbit hole how did you get started and why did you want to get started in the film industry well okay well that is deep uh i'm gonna share i'll tell you how old i am now but uh, 1989 (laughs) was the first job that i had and it was the grand opening of disney mgm studios two hour nbc television special um it's a very long story but in for your you know audience members i'll I'll try to keep it a little concise Mm -hmm. um the idea was uh, I was a uh, Penn State uh, hotel restaurant management. Uh, I got accepted into their uh, college training program. Uh, well, it's the WDW program um, for internships. And I got three months in Disney. And after I finished the internship program, I my manager accepted me into the four-year management training program. So I stayed at Disney. Uh, I was allowed to stay there and finish my education at Penn State. They they actually have a college at Disney, Disney University. Mm-hmm. So um, I signed a contract. It's like the military. It's a four-year contract. And the management training program, you learn all the different areas of Disney. All the, you, you work in every single possible area. And uh, during one of those rounds, uh, <laughs> it was kind of funny. There was a, a girl that thought I was cute. Mm-hmm. So she said, hey, uh, you should come work with us over at the uh, film and television, you know, tape. they called it film and tape at the time. Mm-hmm. Now, originally, uh, I thought film and tape was selling 35 millimeter film and VHS tapes in the kiosk at the Magic Kingdom. Of That's course. kind of what I thought it was. So. Um, uh boy i'm sorry it's kind of a I'm, i try to make it a shorter story but i can't so let's Fair just enough. go for do, do it. you do your thing dude. do your thing i'll just do my thing um so one one i was working in the employee cafeteria dish room of disney mgm studios um i was a bit of a rebel i i kind of messed around with the the way disney's management was they got pissed at me they put me into um 
super secret uh, probation. And that was working midnight shift at the employee cafeteria dish room at Disney MGM. So a woman came in, heard me complaining about how I hated my job. I stuck my head out. You know, I, I apologized to her. Sorry. And, you know, she's like, oh, you look so cute. And oh, you seem so upset. What's wrong? So I told her all the problems I had working with Disney. And she said, well, you should come and work with us at Film and Tape. And again, it's I thought it was something different. So she gave me a, a, a they call it a cross utilization form, which means you're allowed to stay within the training program. She knew what the training program was. She's like, all you have to do is get your supervisor to sign this form. And then the three months that you are required to work, it's every three months you work in a different position. So get your supervisor to sign this. And for the three months, you can come work with us. I said, all right, great. No idea what she was doing other than I thought I'd be selling you know, VHS tapes. So uh, next day, see my supervisor. I go to her and I said, please, you know, I, I know I'm not, you know, I'm not the best employee, but I, I need to, you know, get out of here for a little bit and it'll clear my head. I, I tried to explain to her how it would be better for me. Mm -hmm. She just looked at me dead, dead pants there and says, Chris, don't you know we're opening a studio? I need every body I can get body. And boy, that pissed me off. And I'm like, I'm a, I'm a body. I'm a slab of meat working, you know, at the freaking dish room. Mm. So, uh, you know, impetuous kid, you know, 20 years old, no idea. I swore a couple of times and said, I quit. And I walked out the door. As I walked out, she says, don't use us as your stepping stone. I had no idea what she was talking about. So um, I go back to my apartment with my eight roommates and basically called the lady and I said, oh, my God, oh, my God, I just, you know, I think I just quit my job. And she goes, don't worry about it, Chris. Why don't you come in and meet my boss? We'll figure it all out. So the next day uh, I go into and it's a trailer way in the back lot of Disney MGM. They're still pulling up palm trees. That's how new this was. So I go in and uh, she says to me, Chris, when the door opens, go talk to my boss. So I said, I sat there and I was just watching people come in and out. It was very interesting uh, cross section of, of employees. So uh, door opens and I hear it literally is uh, like the voice of God, you know, come in young man. And I walk in and sitting behind the desk, if any of your audience ever saw the movie, Oh God, with George Burns and yeah. you know, John Denver, swear to God, it looked just like George Burns with the little sailor hat, big thick glasses, polo shirt, but he was a much bigger man sitting behind the desk. He doesn't get up. He just literally motions me to sit down. So I sit down and then he crosses his arms and says, tell me a story. I'm like, okay, I'm 20, again, 20 year old kid. I have no idea. So I just tell him a story about me and Disney, yada, yada, yada. And the last thing I tell him is, you know, and my boss told me, don't use us as your stepping stone. And I said, sir, I don't know what that means, but here I am. So he's nodding the whole time, you know, nodding, you know, you know very stern look, but, but paying attention, you know. He takes off his glasses just like this, and he looks at me and points his finger and says, "Fuck them! You work for me now." Uh, I don't know like what that movie. meant. It's like a movie. <laughs> oh, dude, I, I had no idea at the time what that was. So I, I was just like, "Well, thank you, sir. I really appreciate that." And he said, "Go talk to you know. Uh, I think her name was Joanne, but I'm not sure. So go talk to Joanne. She'll set you up." I said, all right, well, thank you. Thank you. And I go outside and Joanne's like, how'd it go? And I go, I, I, he said, I work for him now or I work here now. And she's like, oh, that's great. So she types on the computer. Now, 1989, the computers were huge. I mean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. giant monitor things. And it was the, the screen was black with green, you know, anyway. Um, so she types my name in the computer and she's like, Chris, what's your social? I'm going to make sure we get all your paperwork in order. And so she types me in and then a red flashy thing comes up on screen and she goes oh no you've been red flagged and i'm like red flag what does that mean she goes well turns out your boss over at the uh the cafeteria made you uh not unhirable a non-hireable for disney which means i'm not allowed to hire you back at disney and i mean i'm shaking i'm like oh my Gosh. god i signed a four-year deal this is like the military i'm gonna get in trouble i'm, not, I'm gonna lose my education I'm it was just like you know i was completely falling apart and she goes chris calm down i'll take care of this tomorrow morning report to bungalow seven at you know eight o'clock eight a.m and i said 
okay. And she goes, just calm down. I will take care of it. You're working with us. Don't worry about it. I said, okay, okay. So the next day, uh, I report to Bungalow 7. And it's interesting because I thought I was going in to be trained for selling 35 millimeter <laughs> film and VHS tapes. Sure, sure. But, but there's a bungalow. There's golf carts running around all over the place. There's cases, you know, tour cases being in and out. Um, uh, they gave me a name, Sally Hinkle. They said, go find Sally Hinkle. She's your immediate boss. I said, okay, great. So I, I ask a few people and they point at this little four foot 10 girl. I go over there and she's loading coolers uh, with sodas, bottled water, stuff like that, ice. But she's very small, so she can't lift any of the stuff. So I walk up, you know, big strapping man. And I say, Sally, I'm Chris. I think I'm supposed to be working with you. And she goes, great, great. So she starts directing me, load this, do this, put ice in this cooler. I need this cooler in that golf cart. And without asking any questions, without even wondering anything. I just literally follow direction. I like boom, 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 boom. The whole day. I mean, I worked a good 10 to 12 hours that day. Didn't ask any questions. I was delivering coolers, camera setups, uh, interview setups. There was lighting setups. There was a couple of stages all around the park I went to. And the whole time, I'm just like, this is cool. What the hell am I doing here? But I was so afraid to ask anyone anything. Because I just, I, 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 after what I experienced with my boss, I was like freaking out. So I just did what everybody told me to do. And then at the end of the day, we're done. We're sitting in the production office and Sally and I, you know, we're just, you know, having a nice chat. And I say, Sally, listen, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to seem like an, an idiot or stupid or anything, but what exactly are you guys doing here? And she looked at me and goes, Chris, you don't know what you're doing here? I said, well, I know what I'm doing here. You told me what to do, but what is this? And she goes, you're working on a TV show. It's called the the two-hour NBC television special for NBC, uh, the grand opening of Disney MGM Studios. I'm like, really? What's my title? She goes, well, you're my assistant. I'm the craft service person, so you're the assistant craft service. I'm like, no, oh, that's cool. And she goes, have you ever done this before? I said, no, this is my first time. And at first she was, I could see her getting a little pissed. She's like, you know, she, she, she said, damn it. I hate getting newbies. And I said, Sally, did I do a good job? She goes, Chris, you were amazing. I swear to God. I thought you knew what you were doing. I said, I do. If you tell me, and if you tell me, you won't have to tell me again. And she goes, all right. So that was my first job. That in was, the entertainment industry. And that was the big, and that was the beginning that this, was the beginning. Yeah. Of, wow. That's, a, you know, and so, you know, what's funny is that uh, you and I walked over the same dead bodies at Disney MGM because my first job was I went to Full Sail. Oh, and yeah. My first Fair intern, enough. my first internship was at Disney MGM as a PA or as an intern, actually, not even a PA working for, oh, God, what was his name? The producer of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Swanson's. He was on the back lot. It was this Wait, is ninety. 90- Ted, Ted Swanson? No, not Ted. Um, oh god. Because I worked I with Ted Swanson. That that's another story. But yeah, no, 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 no. It was another. But I worked. I worked. He was like the big. It was big cheese because he had just finished. Ted K. Yeah. Ted, what is it? Ted K. Not Ted K. It was Bob somebody Allen? else. Sw- Swanson, Swinson, something like that. But it was he was yeah, the producer know. of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from nineteen ninety, and it was at that time the biggest independent film of all time. And he was working on a new TV show and we were shooting on Universal, but his production offices were at MGM. Uh, and that's how I got started. So I st- got started at Disney MGM as well. So I. Wow. We were there at the same time, dude. That's now, Were you there crazy. in 95? Were you there in 95? I left in 96. I was there in 95. I went to, uh, I graduated in 96. So during 95, we, you and me were probably. We missed each in. other. Yeah. That's hilarious. But that's how I got, that's how I got my start in the business as well. So that's too funny, man. Um, now you jumped from, uh, you well, know, from what can I, I, can I add something real quick, Alex? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, just to finish off, you know, bookend the story. Um, many, many days go by, a week goes by. I'm in the office. Uh, the production coordinator was named D. So, you know, D always, she was trying to figure out where everybody was coming from because Disney was just opening and, yeah. you know, Florida didn't really have that big of a production team. Mm-hmm. So uh, she says, Chris, uh, I'm just curious, how did, how did you come to the production? And I said, well, I, I went to talk to a man named Jim Washburn. And when, you know, he told me I was working for him 
And the whole production office kind of went quiet when I said the name Jim Washburn. So D's like, Chris, you spoke to Jim Washburn. I said, yeah. Meaning in person, you were actually met Jim Washburn. I'm like, yeah, I went to his office and, you know, he looked like George Burns. It was kind of funny. Um, so she goes, interesting. And I'm like, D, why is that interesting? Well, Chris, Michael Eisner sent uh, Jim Washburn here to open the studio. He's in charge of everyone. He is the boss of the entire studio. Everybody. And no one's met Jim. <laughs> he sits in a little trailer in the back and you know we no one's ever really met him he comes in and out and he comes from burbank so you really met him huh i said yeah i really met him he's the one who hired me she goes huh okay and the whole office treated me like king they were like oh my god you know jim Austin. oh my god you know then that was my first introduction to how hollywood worked <laughs> Yeah, it's it, anyway. You know, isn't that isn't that funny? Which we'll, we'll get to uh, your stories. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Your your stories coming up uh, in a little bit after afterwards of you you working with certain people in the business. But as I was looking through your IMDb, man, you at the beginning you were jumping from PA to wardrobe assistant to like you were doing a production. Uh, you were doing any job it seemed. At the beginning, you were on Oscar, which I freaking love Oscar. That's a Lester Stallone movie. John Landis was an interesting fellow. <laughs> Is he the director of that? I forgot. John Landis directed it, yeah. Oh, I heard, I've heard nothing but interesting stories about John. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll the go least. there if you want, but I, you know. We All right, know. one John Landis story. Give me one John Landis story. Well, there's only – I have one John Landis story, and it, it – it, so I was hired as the local assistant to Leslie Belberg. Mm -hmm. Leslie was John Landis as a producing partner. Mm -hmm. And um, again, this is, I'm, I'm only in the business, you know, probably under a year, you know, it's mm -hmm. been about eight months, nine months. And I've worked on a couple of different things. And uh, Leslie said to me, she goes, Chris, we're going to be doing a lot of lunches and a lot of dinners. And I need you to take notes for me. I always had a notebook in my little fanny pack with pens and, you know, everything. I'm like, yes, yes, Leslie, no problem. No problem. So we were out uh, one of these dinners and um, I was taking notes and it was Leslie and John and myself. And there was one other person there. And I, to honestly, I cannot remember his name, but John, John was in a mood. So, you know, he was basically insulting everyone. It, you know, he was pissed off at the wait staff. He was pissed off because his water was warm. You know, he got a phone, you know, you know, we didn't have really cell phones. I mean, I guess they brought a phone to him because somebody was trying to reach him. He was pissed off the guy on the phone and he just had this big rant. I was taking notes, but, you know, not about a rant, but, you know, John was just angry and he was just kind of going off on everybody. And then at the end of the dinner, I said to Leslie, I said, I said, Leslie, is he, is he always like this? I mean, it, boy, it, you know, he, he seems to, cause he was, uh, he was going off on everybody. And Leslie's like, Chris, listen, sometimes directors, you know, they're very creative and they, you know, they just express themselves differently. And I, and I said, well, it just seems like he hates all human beings <laughs> because he basically insulted everyone. I thought it, it was almost like a stand up act, but it wasn't. And, uh, and Leslie's like, you know, Chris, just uh, keep that under your hat and we'll just keep going. I'm like, okay, no problem. But, you know, it, I, John Landis was actually the first very, uh, um, uh, what do you say, successful director I got to meet. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it hit that it, one experience, that one dinner I had with dealing with what he was going through in his mind, it actually helped me later in my career. And I know we'll, 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 we'll talk about that later. But, yeah, exactly. It helped you with. Uh, so that's a John, you know, last one. By the way, they were at Universal because the Oscar set in uh, Burbank burned down. Oh, so they shot they shot it in Florida. I didn't know they, they shot oh, it in right. Florida. Yeah, because yeah. I, there was a big giant fire at Universal, and the entire yeah, Oscar set caught fire. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they, they. I remember that fire. Yeah, they burned out. It burned down uh, the Back to the Future set. They had to rebuild it. And that was that. the Oscar Oscar set was using the same one. Oh, that makes sense. Do you remember? Do you remember the Swamp Thing set? Yeah, of course. With I worked with Boris. Oh wow! That's I was cool. I was the office I was the office production assistant. Mm. on fortune hunter it was a show wait a second you worked I, on fortune hunter I so did i no you didn't i worked in the art department 
I worked in the office. <laughs> oh my was, god, I dude, <laughs> dude, this is a podcast. I understand. Stand, but you're gonna love this hold on give me one second I'm okay have to flip. Hold we'll, on. We'll, we'll, we'll hold this is awesome <laughs> your audience is gonna love this i don't know if you're gonna remember this uh-huh. but are you ready for this yes no, no, stop it stop it where is it oh wait a minute is that the thing that's from... the dagger from fortune hunter the prop <laughs> guys <laughs> that's amazing you had it like candy that's great oh my god dude seriously Either I'm going to get arrested and the cops will show up because I, you know. I look if if Chris Hemsworth is not being uh, arrested for the six ha- Thor hammers he stole off the set, I think you'll be okay. Wait, I didn't steal this. I was given to this as a gift from someone who thought uh, I did a very good job. And well, uh, that's probably the only thing that but anyway, from that check movie, that out. That, that is the fortune hunter wow. dagger. So I was working with with uh, uh the, the, that teenage mutant ninja turtle producer, but then across the hall. There was Fortune Hunter, and then I I got I got I got uh, I was the office PA, so anything in the office, so I was there with the writers and I was there with the producers. And Boris made me move him. Uh, he's like, "Hey, I got a job for you," and they drove me out to his house and I moved him for free, like wow. literally heavy lifting. <laughs> It's insane. Well, it's so insane. We, yeah. So you and I worked on the same project. Together. Now, also, Fortune Hunter was a show where I had the tip of my thumb cut off on Fortune oh, Hunter. Oh. I had to go to the hospital because we were loading. I was art department and I pretty much did everything. I was loading a truck and we were using the lift gate as leverage. And oh, my no. hand slipped no. off the corner, got caught in the lift gate just as the lift gate was coming up. No. Cut the tip of my thumb off. That must have been fun. Yeah, but the, uh, you know, we had all the art department guys were there. They called the ambulance. They took me. Now, here's the funny story is that in the ambulance, they had my thumb in ice. They had the tip of it in ice. In the ambulance, we're going, and the medic is asking me all these questions like, what happened? How'd this happen? You know, what are you guys doing out there? Right, right. And then as we're pulling up, you know, he when, when I first got in the ambulance, he put the oxygen in my nose. Yeah. And as we're, you know, nothing was coming through but you know i figured all right well that's the way it is i never had oxygen in my nose before so we're driving and he's asking me all these questions about production and almost just as we're pulling up to the hospital he says hey how do i get a job i want to work in production <laughs> and i'm that's looking at is. him that's what it and is. then i i just looked at him and was like hey is there supposed to some, some oxygen something supposed to be coming through my nose and he goes oh yeah click he forgot to put the oxygen on that he put into my nose Nice. In the meantime, he's asking for a job. And then as they're wheeling me in, he goes, hey, do you think you could talk to your boss? I mean, you're going to be out for a while. Maybe I can take your place. Holy Jesus, man. And this is Florida. Dave, this, this is, is Florida. This not even L.A. This is Florida. And get this. They hired him. No. I, I, I told my boss. I said, listen, I'm going to be out. You need just labor or hand. I said, hire the guy. He seems like a nice guy. They interviewed him. They hired him to replace me until I came back. Wow. And now and, well, then, and you yeah. launched another career that God knows where he went. <laughs> so this is a lesson for everybody listening. The the world of, of film production is extremely small, apparently. <laughs> that decades later we found out that we were working on the same production and we never met each other. That's right. <laughs> I've never met anybody else from from fortune hunter in oh, all yeah. of my years in this business that is amazing man that's yeah awesome. uh, i don't know if you remember the, the 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 production designer orvis rigsby i don't i don't remember that that's who I, I was i was all in the office i i yeah. went to set like once or twice i think yeah, yeah, yeah. um but if anybody's interested you could try to find an episode somewhere on youtube or something it was it was one season it was pretty bad it was a pretty bad show um i still remember this is what i still remember one of the pas I'll never forget this. And by the way, anyone listening, great lesson if you're working in the office. The, the show comes out, premieres, and then all the reviews come out. And the PA, <laughs> some PA, cut out every review and pasted them up on the walls of the office. Unfortunately, every review was bad. <laughs> so the showrunner comes in and they have to talk them off a ledge. <laughs> And they, I don't think, I think they fired that poor girl. <laughs> you don't, that's just, that's just, you don't do things like that. 
So, all right. So you, you, you've been, a, you've done a bunch of stuff over the years and you were a production manager and then you met a, a young up and coming filmmaker named Jimmy, Jimmy Cameron was his name. <laughs> yeah. Jimmy Cameron. Sure. Yeah. Uh, James Cameron. Uh, you worked with Mr. J- Jim Cameron um, for how many years did you work with Jim? So uh, in the year 2000, uh, we started uh, from 2000, 2005. I, I was his production supervisor, production manager, and then eventually associate producer. Um, so for five years, I, I worked on uh, Ghost of the Abyss, Aliens of the Deep, Expedition Bismarck, and Last Mysteries of Titanic. Those are the four documentaries we did with Jim. But uh, I became best friends with his brother, John, John Cameron. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's the baby brother of the family. And uh, John was a, a six-year Marine veteran. So whenever anyone watches a James Cameron movie, there are Marines in his movies. The reason there are Marines is because of his brother, John. So John was, uh, for years, uh, a Marine, uh, Marine consultant, military mm-hmm. consultant. Mm-hmm. Um, so I became best friends with John. And then for the next 15 years, um, I had other things that, you know, I was the, for six years, I was the vice president of production at a company called Entertainment One Television. But during the that time frame, John Cameron would just would call me out of the blue and say, hey, I need a favor or hey, I need this or hey, I need that. So I've been in and out of the Cameron lives for over 20 years. Wow. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, because that was the that time that you were with him is I like to call that the uh, the deep sea walkabout that Jim did. <laughs> I mean, Jim is a very, a very special filmmaker, to say the least. Yeah. And uh, I, I've, I've always wondered what was. Because I can imagine the, I don't know if it was the pressure or whatever, but like after Titanic, you, it's the biggest movie of all time. I imagine that there's pressure on you to do something like next. And maybe he's like, you know what? I'm just going to go do something I want to do. And it, it really seems like Jim really wanted to just become a, not just a deep sea explorer, but like a legitimate, like he's in the, in the, in the, uh, the archives of, of, deep sea explorers like he's up there with Jacques Cousteau and I mean he's a serious yeah. he, he does the work um well, so Jim, Jim's also an engineer people don't know that oh no yeah I know yeah he, he's he engineers he's his own his own equipment he he create you know he engineered the cameras they're using on Avatar with you know Sony with well, like, other so I, companies so I gotta ask you sorry so you worked with Jim so closely I mean I've look I've had I've had many people who worked with Jim on the show and I've heard I love Jim Cameron stories I've heard I've got like probably about five or 10 of them that I've, my guests have told me over the years on air and off. <laughs> it's because some you have to tell off air, some you have to tell on, you can tell on air, but they're just brilliant. And you just go, okay, from someone who works so closely with them, I haven't spoken to anyone who's worked really close with them for such a long period of time. And especially over 20 years coming back and forth into, into his camp The I've always understood that Jim is a genius at a level that we can't really comprehend in 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 you know he's just at a whole other playing field when it comes to filmmaking when it comes to the technical aspects of filmmaking he's at a whole other place and that he gets frustrated with people who can't live up to what he thinks he can what he is able to do uh so what is your experience with jim in is that a truth is that basically a fair statement to say that is jim that kind of just like so at a different level than everybody else around him. Well, um, okay. So little disclaimer uh, that, you know, Jim, Jim is many, many things. Um, the way I can explain it is that um, if you had your solar system, Jim is the sun. And then we are all planets revol- revol- revolving around the sun. That's when he does a project. Now, listen, you know, as your film community knows, and as you know, the director is the boss on set. So Jim is the boss and he has a very specific vision, a very specific way of doing things. Very, you know, he has honed this thing for 30 years, 40 years in some of the biggest movies. And that's why he is who he is. So uh, I came, I went into it with the understanding that this is my choice. I am on set because I want to be here and I believe that I am good enough to be here. Mm-hmm. Now that comes with a whole laundry list worth of stuff that you're going to have to deal with. Um, I got fired four times in five years. Wow. Uh, three of the times had nothing to do with me. And one of the times had everything to do with me. 
but um, you know, he, you have to learn how to work with someone that is of that caliber. And um, I soon learned that, you know, within a year, year and a half um, that when Jim gets upset, he gets up upset at a situation that's not working the way he expects it to. So whomever is in the line of fire is just going to get, you know, shot at. And, you know, I don't mean with guns, but I mean with just verbal, you know, like frustration that he's coming out with. So in the three times I got fired, you know, Jim, you know, was pissed off because scheduling didn't work. Some equipment didn't show up. So, I mean, there were, there was production reasons. stuff, production, production stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's production yeah. stuff. So, you know, I happen, you know, I am, you know, as a production supervisor, production manager and associate producer, I am the one having to deal with execute everything. So ultimately it's my responsibility, but you know, it's not always my fault because there are other contributing factors that maybe Jim may not be aware of. So of those three times, you know, you know, he was yelling and squaring and pissed and throwing things He's like, get the hell out. You're fired. I don't, you know, I can't believe this. Uh, da, 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 da. So as I'm packing up and every, all three of these times are almost exactly the same. I'm trying to, I'm packing up, ready to leave the office as I'm walking out, Jim comes in and I'm like scared. I'm like, Oh God, he's going to hit me or something. He did never did. But you feel, you I've, feel I've, that. I've never heard him. I've never heard of, of a physical altercation with Jim. No, no. I've never heard of any story of that. No. I've heard it with J Joe Picca. I've heard that with. <laughs> but I've not so, No, no. Jim, Jim, Jim verbally assaults. He doesn't yeah. uh, physically assault. But mm -hmm. there was there was one time that he he himself was physically assaulted. And I'll I'll tell you that in a second. Sure. So, um, yeah. You know, as I'm leaving, Jim looks at me and goes, where are you going? And I said, well, you just fired me he goes get back to work i've got things to do you know don't waste my time with that just you know you know i need this and this and this and this i'm like okay okay so i go back to my desk and i start working it turns out that what happens is in that moment you know it the fuse burns very bright but then when it burns out he kind of forgets about it or not, i don't know if he forgets about it but he puts it off and he's like it is no longer a priority and no longer a issue so um over the course of a year and a half you learn that you know, when he's yelling at you, you just you look him in the eye and you nod and you say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you you make sure that he knows you are hearing him. You are listening and paying attention and responding. But don't put fuel on the fire. Don't don't engage in the argument. You just allow him to do his thing. Tell him he allow him to say what he needs to say. And then soon you will see his level of anger draw down to almost nothing where he just kind of. It's like, all right, good talk, and then walks away. And that's what I learned on how to deal with Jim. Now, the one time I did get fired that had everything to do with me. Um, do you, can I, you want to hear the story? Is, Absolutely. Is, Any Jim okay. stories you want to say, we, we have time for them. <laughs> these, these are the best. <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, all right. We just finished um, uh, uh, Aliens of the Deep. Uh, we're getting ready to uh, no, sorry, it wasn't aliens that beat. We just finished Expedition Bismarck. Ah, shit, we finished one, one of, of them. those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what happened was, uh, uh, I got, um, I finished up. We were in the Azores, which is an island chain in the middle of the Atlantic. It's part of the Portuguese por Portugal. So we we stopped the boat there. We unpacked. You know, I had to ship everything out of Portugal. It all got done. And then uh, it was a Thursday and I flew back to L.A. and uh, I went back to my apartment. I got a, a message on my answer machine. I pick it up. It's John Cameron. John calls me and says, hey, Chris, I need to talk to you. So I call him back and he says, I need you to meet Jim in Nice, France, Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Now, today it's a Thursday. So I'm like, Nice, Sunday morning. Got it. What am I doing? John says, it's a need to know basis. I said, well. You're sending me to Nice. Don't you think I need to know? And he goes, nope. I said, well, how long am I going to be there? He said, pack enough stuff for a week. I said, okay, what do I need to bring? He says, bring a camera. Okay. Can you tell me what I'm doing? He's like, no. I said, all right. Now I'm used to this because uh, Jim and his whole family run production like it's black ops for the military. They very rarely give anyone information unless it directly deals with what's going on at the moment. So, I'm used to this. I'm like, fine. I've been flying coach all around the world for the last two years. I said, John, do you think you can fly me business class? And he goes, why? I said, what do you mean, why? Because 
you know, I, I want to, you're, you're telling me to go do this and you won't tell me why. So fly me business class. I was, I, so I got to fly business. So I get on a plane. I, I land in Nice, France. Yeah, I don't know. Friday, Saturday, I forget which day. Anyway, um, I land there. Let's say it's a Saturday. So maybe it was a Friday. He called me and so on. So I land in Nice, France on Saturday. Um, I have a credit card. I have cash. I didn't have a hotel reservation. I didn't have any of that stuff. So it didn't really matter because I know how to do what I'm doing. And I, there was a lot of stuff. I got sent to various places with no planning whatsoever. But Jim knew that, you know, just send Chris. He'll know what to do. So I uh, found a really expensive hotel on the beach. I go there. Uh, I call uh, John. I say, John, I'm in Nice. Can you please tell me where I'm going, what I'm doing? And he says, all right, write this down. He gives me an address. I write down a piece of paper and goes, I need you to meet Jim at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. And I, yeah, it was a Saturday. So I had to meet him at Sunday morning, 9 a.m. I said, okay, no problem. I go down to the front desk. I don't, I, I've never been to Nice before. This is my first time. Go down to the front desk. I show the ladies at the front desk here. I need to you know, go to this address. So they pull out a map. And they're trying to find the address. You know, these are French ladies. They can't find it. And then one of the ladies pull, pulls out a different map, pulls out a map of France. Now, you know, France, if you imagine, is like a big giant circle. And, you know, Nice is like up here. And okay. one of the ladies says, oh, ici, ici, when she finds here in French, she finds the place and she points down here. Now, Nice is here and she goes down here. It's in Marseille. John sent me to the wrong city in France. <sighs> he didn't know. So uh, I, the ladies at the front desk tell me, uh, how, I say, how do I get, you know, I speak a little French. So I was able to communicate. So I was like, how do I get there? They said, well, you can rent a car, but it's eight hours. I'm like, I can't do that. Plus I've never been here. I don't know. But then the lady said, there's a train. It's a cattle train that runs all around the country of France, delivering, you know, agriculture and sheep and cows and stuff like that. So uh, she, her father was a farmer. So she said, I will, you know, I can get you on this train. So it, it left at 11 p.m. that night. So I grab all my bags. Now, I was staying in a really nice hotel. <laughs> the ladies didn't even charge me for the hotel room just because they thought it, you know, what I was about to do was crazy. So I got on the cattle car train. And there are no seats. They're, they're planks of wood. And there's chicken shit. There's feathers. There's sheep shit. They're, they're just, it's disgusting. So it's like, it's like business class, but different. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so I get on the train and it's about a six hour train thing, you know, train drive, you know, whatever trip. And uh, there's, the, the the bench is you know for the whole night so i get i pull into marseille it's i don't know like 7 a.m or something so there's one cab out front uh, i i show the address to the cab driver and he goes 100 euro I'm like okay so i whip out 100 euro hand it to him and i get in the back seat he was waiting for me to haggle but you know i didn't haggle so he's like oh okay so it takes us an hour to get to the address we get to the address it's a feed mill for animals. That's what it is. So I'm looking at this feed mill going, this cannot be the address. So we drive around a whole bunch of times and we keep confirming it's a feed mill. So we go to the little town. There's a tourist kiosk in the middle. So I go and I tell the cab driver, drop me off. He drops me off. And then I get on the phone and I called John Cameron. I say, John, I think I'm here. I'm not at the address, but I'm at the town. Uh, there's a there's a boat yard. There's a this, there's a store. I'm at a tourist kiosk and he says to me, all right, great. I'll have Jim meet you there in about an hour. And then he hangs up and I'm sitting in this tourist kiosk going, this will be interesting. Jim's going to meet me. How does he know where the hell I am? But okay, whatever. So an hour goes by a big silver van pulls up. It's Jim Cameron, Susie and all the kids. And Jim goes, Hey, Chris, how was your trip? And I go, great, Jim. And I get in, I throw my bags in the in the van and I jump in the van and we start driving. Uh, now, Josephine is uh, Susie, is Jim's child from Linda Hamilton. Mm -hmm. So Josie is like about 10 years old. Josie reaches over and goes, she's like sniffing me. And she goes, ooh. And, and she goes, mommy, he smells terrible. I was sitting in a cattle car and cheap shit for the last eight hours. So yeah, of course I smell terrible. Um, and she's like, stop it, Josie, stop it. 
So we get back to the feed mill and there's a, it turns out there's a road behind the feed mill. It's completely hidden. Nobody would know it was there. We get there and the driver gets out, opens the gate for the road. And Jim looks at me and starts nudging going, wait till you see, wait till you see. So I'm like, I have no idea why I'm there, but I'm not asking any questions. So we get in the road, we go back and there's a giant warehouse, like Costco size warehouse. And the driver, we all get out and uh, the driver's opening the door and Jim does that, that to me again. He goes, wait till you see, wait till you see. He's like a little child, you know, very excited. So we go into the warehouse and I look inside this warehouse and there are two submarines. I mean, submarines in the warehouse, along with four boats, four trucks, shelves and shelves and shelves of equipment, a big office with file cabinets and copy machines and the whole thing. It's just a giant operation. And I'm standing there and I'm like, what the hell is this? And, you know, Jim is just kind of like, it, it's Christmas and he just opened his presents. So he comes over to me and goes, so what do you think? And I'm like, pretty cool, man. This is amazing. Wow. Look at all this stuff. And then he looks at me. Now, I, we, we're in here for maybe five minutes. He looks at me, crosses his arms and goes, so how long is it going to take you to ship these two submarines, those four trucks, those four boats and everything in this warehouse back to my ranch in Santa Barbara? I had no idea what I was doing there in the first place. So, you know, hello, Mr. Production Manager, Production Supervisor. I look at this and I literally have no answer for him. <clears throat> I don't know how to ship two submarines. I don't know how to do half of the stuff that I was doing with them anyway. So the only thing I could do was the only answer I gave him. And I said, Jim, there is an awful lot of equipment in this warehouse. Can we spend some time and walk through it so I can have a better analysis of what this is? And he goes, yes. Great answer. Yeah, let's go do that. The whole time we're walking through it, I'm like, fuck, 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 shit, shit, fuck. I don't know what the fuck. What's that? I don't know what that is. What the hell? What am I doing here? Why didn't John tell me? I'm so pissed. You know, John. But uh, I'm saying this in my head, you know. So uh, we spent at least an hour, maybe an hour and a half going through it all. Now, luckily, I, I did have some experience moving equipment. So I, I just then put it in my mind that this is all production equipment. I know how to do that. But with submarines, I'm thinking, well, there's some government's got to get involved with this. I think I'm going to have to deal with naval intelligence coming back to the U.S. They may not just let submarines come into the U.S. So I started thinking about all these things. And then we go back into the office and Jim again sits down and goes, all right, how long is it going to take you to get all this stuff? Now, I want to give myself as much time as humanly possible, but also know that Jim's never whatever that number is, it's not going to be soon enough. So I said, Jim, I would love 12 weeks because on a, on a production of a big movie or something, we usually have 12 weeks of prep, give or take, you know? So I figured, you know, it's enough time that, you know, I could prep it. I could do the videotape, you know, photograph. Jim just looks at me and slams his fist in the desk and goes, 12 weeks. What are you talking about? Fucking 12 weeks. I ain't 12 weeks. I'm going to give you four. And I was, I'm like, I said, Jim, I'll be honest, man. I mean, there's submarines in there. I'm going to have to deal with the French government. I'm going to have to deal with the U.S. government. I'm going to have to deal with organizations I've never dealt with before. I said, can you give me eight? And then he looks at me and goes, hmm, okay. Tell you what, I'll give you six. Okay, I'll take six. Better than four. Maybe not as good as 12, but all right, whatever. So he gave me six weeks and, and he says, you have unlimited resources, but make sure you don't spend any more money than you should. I said, okay. Now for James Cameron being who he is and what he's worth and the movies he does, very frugal, very smart, very businesslike. He's a businessman beyond anything, you know, businessman, filmmaker, energy engineer, whatever. So I know how to do that. So they, uh, the kids are playing on the submarines and everybody's running around. So they gather everybody together, go out in the van. And Jim gets in the van with the kids. And I said, so what's next? And he goes, well, you go to work. Uh, my, we're on vacation. So we'll talk to you soon. And they get in the van and they drive away. I'm standing alone with my bags in a parking lot in the middle of France. I don't even, I'm like, okay, here we go. 
That's my Jim Cameron story. Jeez. And then you just had to find a place to stay. You had to, like, you I had had to, do, to do, yeah, I had to do everything. And uh, ironically enough, we had just finished Expedition Bismarck. So these German kids I hired from the Hamburg Film School, they were amazing. They helped me with, uh, you know, sit prep and PA, that kind of stuff. So I called the, the lead guy that I had from Germany and I said, hey, Oliver, I need 10 of your guys. I'll fly you in, put you up really nice hotel per DM, the whole nine yards, whatever you need. But I need your help. And I got six weeks to do this. Thing. So I brought in an entire German contingency and they did everything. It was great. So did you did you make it in six weeks? I've five, actually. Five weeks to ship all that stuff over. I mean, I've heard that. Jesus. It's like, I mean, I've met these. I've met certain people like this. Uh, never like never Jim. Never had the pleasure to meet Jim yet. But these kind of almost godlike figures in the film industry who just yeah be careful that godlike they are not but you, you know, know what they, i mean but like in the myth the myth of of who the yeah, yes. not godlike they're definitely human beings without question and yeah. they have their frailties and everything like that but they've lived in their world for so long that they don't like i remember i had a story of a filmmaker who was on set with with jim and he's saying to Jim, he's like, yeah, I made my last movie for like $100,000. And Jim's head, like almost like gears started to pop in his head because he couldn't comprehend a feature film being made for $100,000. Like he just yeah. couldn't, he yeah. couldn't grasp, literally couldn't grasp the idea. He's like, what do, what do, I don't understand what he mean. <laughs> Things like that. So it's really interesting to see that. Like, you know, when you have your kids playing on submarines, that's just generally not a normal <laughs> scenario. Yeah without question and then i've heard the stories of his 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 compound and and uh in malibu and the, sure. he has the he has the uh was it the yacht in the front yard just in case the the, the well the that title. that's all changed um okay jim, jim no longer is a resident no longer lives here in the u.s oh, okay oh really i didn't know that he moved him and his entire family to new zealand interesting yeah, so because they're shooting because he's shooting avatar, shooting avatar two three four five and six is he going to do five more of these? I thought he was only going to do like three or four, five more of these. That's, what, gonna, that's what the plan is. That's what the, but he's already got like, what? Two, two and three. three. Two, two, two is coming three. out over Christmas this year. Uh -huh. Three, I don't know when three is coming out, but he had made some comment to me, to us a long time ago saying, well, I'm going to die on Pandora. He'll be 90 by the time he finishes six. I was gonna say, like, can he finish all of these? Like, how, I mean, how old? Is, how old is Jim? Jim is what? Is he, his birthday. He just, uh, you know, good question. I think it's 65, 63, 4, 5, One of those. But his no, birthday he, was just this month. So yeah. So he no, he's got, and he's he's vegan, so he'll make it. <laughs> he's he was not, he wasn't always vegan, but yeah, he right. Susie made him vegan. Right. Exactly. So, um, all right. So after working with Jim for so long. What are some of the lessons that you picked up from him that made you a better production manager? Because I imagine when you're sharpening your ax on a stone like Jim Cameron, it's going to sharpen faster and, and differently than you would working on Oscar. Yeah, <laughs> well, say. it's a whole different thing, yeah. And then um, now I understand how John Landis prepared you to deal with Jim. <laughs> yeah, because it's it's about communication it's how you talk to people and it's how you talk to people that are used to a certain way of working um so the question was oh so what did i learn um jim kept saying one thing to us he's like he said chris it's that one five dollar part that we're missing that will shut down the entire operation so i became uber duper super duper uh, detail oriented, very sensitive to every single thing, everything that went into a box, how it was packed, how it was moved, where it was. I uh, I literally became a computer program of of equipment, crew, where things are, what things are going. Um, it was I, I had to become a bit of a machine to make mm -hmm. sure that we I knew everything. I knew where everything was at any given moment. No. So that made me better as from a producing standpoint, as far as being detail oriented and your audience and your, your filmmakers should understand that, you know, it's like you have to literally as a, as a line producer, production manager, whoever, you have to think of every single thing in your arsenal and you have to think of everything in very detail.
Right, because you could have everything, but if you don't have the wig that the actress needs for the scene, the whole production shuts down because the wig's not there. Right. So a five dollar, ten dollar, fifty dollar wig Whatever. shuts the entire production down yeah. until that that wig, that wig gets there. So that's a really great a great point. Where is the a- sword? We we can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> the sword. It's on a podcast, circa 2022. <laughs> so working again, working on those docs. Uh, I mean, I, I've I've studied the abyss obscenely. Like I watched the documentary, read books on, on, his, on the production of of that, and that was a pretty intense, one of the worst production experiences for everybody involved ever. Not because of Jim, just because of the nature of what he was trying to achieve. So there was a tremendous amount of pressure. I have to ask you, working on these kind of uh, documentaries where Jim is going down into, you know, deep sea diving and being underwater for a long period of time and decompression and all that kind of stuff coming up, how, how did he, how did you deal with, how did he deal with that pressure, which I'm sure he's used to, but how did you deal with what was coming up out of the water? <laughs> um. Well, I mean, it's the same as I just explained, you know, it's, you know, you have to be ready for anything. You have to be prepared for the worst, prepared for what he's going to ask, prepared for what what's happening. I mean, sometimes the seas were so rough that the entire crew was, you know, throwing up somewhere. Uh, We couldn't find some of the crew half the time, you know, Uh, Jim, we made a deal with the entire crew. It was a 24 hour day, pretty much, Um, meaning if you sign on, you're going to have a lot of downtime, but you're going to have to be available at any given notice. Like, you know, the weather is right. Let's go. We're, we're doing the dive now. So you have to be ready for the dive immediately. Um, I, it just, you literally have to be on the whole time. But, there, but you're not working 24 hours, but when, it, when no, it's time to no, work, no. you work. Well, when you're on a ship, I mean, there's really not much. We, we, had, we had a volleyball court up on, on top. Uh, they uh, used to hit golf balls down to the ocean. Um, the dining room, you know, we'd always be eating or drinking, but that's about it. I mean, so it's there's limited capacity on what to do on board this science vessel that belonged to the Russian government. So, um, but you had to be ready for pretty much everything. So in production, we there's always that day that everything is coming crashing down around you and you feel like the world's about to end. What was that day for you on any of those projects and how did you overcome that, that situation? Um, Ghost of the Abyss, mm-hmm. 9-11, the tower's going down. Oh, we are at sea. So um, I was in St. John's, Newfoundland, preparing uh, for the next leg of our, our trip. Um, the guys were at sea and Jim basically didn't know what to do. I mean, we're, we're under attack. The world's at war. Airports are, are starting, you know, either starting to shut down or shutting down or whatever. Um, so I was asked to go get Jim's family and bring them from California to um, St. John's Newfoundland. So that, you know, Jim didn't know. Everybody was just like not yeah. knowing what was going to go down. Right. So um, uh, we got Jim's family in a private, you know, so we were, John Cameron was able to arrange a private jet. One of the first jets uh, that happened that were allowed to take flight three days after the Twin Towers went down. There was probably about a dozen special requests that were allowed. So, um, we, you know, I got Jim's family from L.A. to um, St. John's, Newfoundland. And then uh, Jim said to me, Chris, I need you to take all the tapes back to Los Angeles. I don't know. We don't know if we're going out. We don't know what's happening. We got permission for a second flight to go back. So could you do that for me? I said, sure, absolutely. So um, it was me and one other the producer we loaded up the private jet with all of the tapes from ghost of the abyss i mean these are originals these are the you know if if our plane yes if our plane went down that he lost the entire documentary so far but it wasn't about that it was about the unknowing it was about not knowing what's happening not knowing what's what to expect because 
finally Jim experienced a situation that was out of his control 100%. So we were all literally on the edge of our seats trying to figure out what to do. But, you know, he came up with a plan as long as the government officials would let him do his plan. Now, Jim was on the board of NASA, so he had a little bit more pull than most traditional people, filmmakers. So um, we got all the uh, the equipment, all the tapes put on the plane, and um, we landed in, I think it was like Minnesota or something, um, because you know St. John's, Newfoundland to LA is a very, very, very long flight. So we landed uh, middle of the night somewhere in Minnesota. When we landed, uh, we were greeted by about a dozen police cars, three fire trucks, a couple of black FBI vans. And we were, they, when they opened up, those, those officers and everybody were standing there with their weapons. They were, you know, because they knew that we had permission to be there, but they didn't know who we were. And everybody was taking precautions. Everybody, you know, was, was a heightened alert. So when we got off and we were greeted that way, we were asked to be, we were escorted off the airplane and moved to a special room where we had FBI agents literally standing over us, you know, and they were asking us questions about what are you doing? You know, we weren't given information about you. We know you have permission, but you got to tell us what's going on. So I explained everything and they, so they searched the airplane. They went through all the boxes of tapes. They went through everything. It took us a couple of hours to get through that. They refueled the airplane and then we were allowed to, to go off to, um, to back to LA. And um, I'll be honest. I mean, for me, that was one of the scariest situations I've ever been in because there was so much unknown mm -hmm. that we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know anything. And, and just to be greeted by, by, by such a large arsenal, you know, not knowing who we were is that was scary as shit too. Um, wow. Anyway, that's, that's a, that's a pretty, that's a pretty insane one. As, as, as insane production stories go, <laughs> that's a, that's a pretty yeah. rough one. Nine eleven was was different. Yeah. Was no, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think we all remember where we were when that happened, and and, and you were in a, on a boat <laughs> with James Cameron shooting a movie at the time. Um, is there any? Is there any other? If you had one crazy story to share about your time with Jim publicly, <laughs> is there? Well, one I just shared with you a pretty good. I mean. I, you know, the, I can actually add on to that same story. So, mm -hmm. um, I got the job done in five weeks. So mm -hmm. I wrote an email to Jim. I gave him a, a full explanation of what I did, how I did it, all of that stuff. Now, um, what I didn't tell you is that Jim sat in the, in that office in France and, you know, and he wrote a 12 page manifesto on how I should ship everything. I mean, you know, right down to dealing with hazardous material, uh, dealing with the submarines. And he said, you know, on his list, he said, you should be talking to naval intelligence. You know, he wrote 12 pages of how to do this. Now, when he had left and left me all alone there, you know, I, I started reading through his manifesto. I got down to the middle of page two is when it all was like, I can't do this. Jim doesn't have have a, a true understanding of the world that we live in as far as the reality of dealing with customs, dealing with uh, Interpol, because Interpol is their version of naval intelligence, dealing with the French government and dealing with the, you know hazardous materials. He's dealt with it before, but he's never really physically dealt with it. So now what he wanted me to do with hazardous materials, I could never do. So when it came down to it, the um, and he said, you know, I wrote him an email telling him what I did. My phone rang within minutes and he said to me, I got your email. Explain to me what you did. Now it was successful for me, but what we did, we, we got it in under time. Everything was categorized. Everything was done by the book. Mm. So I explained to him what I did and there was a silence on the other end. And then I hear a whisper. He's like, listen, and then he started screaming at me how I did not follow his instructions. I did not follow the manifesto. Things are going to get fucked up. And then he just starts screaming and insulting me and yelling at me. I mean, just, I, mean I had to hold the phone out. It was just, but I already knew him by now. So to me, it was just like, nah, 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 nah. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then 
all of a sudden, right in the middle of that rant, the phone goes dead. And later, when you know, later I found out that he had pulled the phone out of the wall, threw it through the production office window, got into his GT that he just bought, and started doing donuts in the parking lot because he was so pissed off. The last thing I heard before that phone got disconnected was burn your passport and don't ever come back to the United States again. So I got another call from Andrew, uh, Jim's producing partner, a couple minutes later. Andrew says, Andrew was in the room when this happened. He's the one who told me what Jim did. So uh, Andrew says to me, Chris, please explain to me everything that you just told Jim. I said, okay. So I did. Andrew said to me, Chris, that's amazing. I can't believe you actually, you did it the way you did it, which is perfect. I wouldn't have done anything different. And the fact that you got everyone to sign off on everything. I had to grease some wheels. I had to give some bribes. I had to do things that probably I shouldn't have done, but I did in order to make that happen. So Andrew was just impressed beyond belief. He's like, that's amazing. Uh, do me a favor. Take a week off. You and the German boys, go rent a yacht. Go enjoy yourself in the South of France. I said, okay, great. So that's what we did. I actually, for 900 euros, I ran a rock yacht for a couple of days. Uh, and a week later, I got an email from Jim saying, Chris, thank you so much. Best thing ever. Couldn't believe it. Wonderful. Great job. Get your ass back here. We got a lot of work to do. Save that email. It's framed on my wall. I, but I have to ask you, so in your from your point of view, what do you think happened in his mind to react that way if everything is perfect it's done what clicks to 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 generate that kind i didn't of do it i didn't do it the way he envisioned it now think of you think put yourself in the mind of a director and the mm -hmm. director is giving instructions to the crew to how to shoot his movie and the crew says eh, you know what we're not going to do it that way we're going to have to do it another way how would a director react wouldn't he be upset? Wouldn't he be angry? Wouldn't he imagine? See, in his mind, he's imagining all of the worst scenarios you could possibly, you know, no matter what I said to him, Jim, the sky is guys purple and, you know, there are, you know, blue bunny rabbits running around. He doesn't right. matter because in his mind, he imagined the worst things happening because I didn't follow his instructions. So, I, again, to me, you know what? That is the way, gene, you know, his genius works. And that's okay. Um, I I learned from that. I learned from that experience. I learned that no matter how right you think you are, it's the way you the message comes across and who you're explaining it to. So I, I have probably one of the most neutral demeanors you can have for Hollywood because I have worked with people like that. And so I know he's I, I want him to be right because he is 99% of the time. He's correct about most things. And you learn from that. You, It's kind of like going out and playing golf with a professional golfer and you're a hacker. You know, you're going to get better just by watching that gentleman play or watch that person play. Mm -hmm. So for me as a producer, I'm going to be better just by watching him do what he does. Now, I don't, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to act like that because that's not who I am. But I know that's who he is. And I'm okay with that. I choose to be here. And I choose to learn from it rather than react to it. You mentioned something earlier when you were your, your first job on on the on uh, MGM Disney MGM, where you had met the the head honcho of MGM. Yeah, too much and how fun. people and how people treated you differently. So how did that translate years later after you were known in the business as Jim Cameron's kind of production manager on top of the mountain? You know, so in, you know, as far as documentaries go, I mean you are you're at the pinnacle you're at the top so i got a lot of offers to do jobs for jobs i got um i was uh the guest lecturing at usc and ucla film schools i went to mm -hmm. la film school and guest lectured mm -hmm. um i taught my own learning annex program um That's i awesome. did a lot of teaching afterwards because um i learned so much from those several years of spending with him and the fact that very few people have that you know jim has the same crew from titanic on Avatar. I mean, you know, Jeff Burdick is one of his technology guys. Jeff has been there for 30 years. Um, and and is, he using Russell, is he using Russell now? For the, he's in D, Russell Carpenter DPing? No, not DP, tech. 
no, 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 for Russell, Russell Carpenter. Isn't maybe, it? maybe he yeah. the, maybe I don't know. What I'm saying is Jim has a uh, production company, Lightstorm. Mm-hmm. Jeff Burdick has been running lights, you know, not running, running the tech side of Lightstorm for Jim for almost 30 years or over 25 years at least. Jeez. So Jim, Jim has a core group of people that aren't leaving. Uh, Terry DePaulo is Jim's uh, number one, is Jim's, you know, eyes and ears for the rest of the world. And, you know, Terry's been there. I was I was there before Terry started, but, you know, Terry's still there. And, you know, it's it's a job that a lot of people don't want to give up. It's a hard job. It's a difficult job. It's not the easiest one in the world. But because you're working for one of the top filmmakers in the world, one of, and, and forget filmmaking for a split second, just call it media manufacturing. You're working for someone who is the CEO of Apple or CEO of you're, you're working for an Elon Musk of filmmaking. Mm-hmm. You great, feel better. Put it, yeah. 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 You're you're you feel different. You feel it empowers you to be better. And that's the way I look at it. Now, some people take that the other opposite direction, and become some Hollywood scumbag and try to use that power against others or or pushing their power on others. I look at it as an educational tool and I try and, you know, I, I do, I still guest lecture. I still do teaching and I still do all that stuff. Sharing this knowledge is something I feel like I have to, because they need to understand working for someone like that, what it means. And you can thrive and succeed from it. If you understand how to do it, how to work with it around it. Yeah. And that's really, this is a really good point because in this business, you're going to run into people like Jim, but, even though Jim is a an anomaly in our industry, really, in the last 30, 40 years, there hasn't been another filmmaker like him. Yeah. Closest I see here now is is Nolan, is the closest I, I can even remote. And even then, he's not an engineer. <laughs> he's not Well, engineer. Peter Jackson, don't forget oh, him. Peter Jackson, yeah, I forgot Peter, Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson is, is amazing. And and Spielberg's always been amazing. I mean, so. I mean but they're di- but they're different kinds of be- yeah. they're different beasts compared yeah. there is only one jim but you will meet people like that who might come off as abrasive uh and and i love what you said that certain people do that who are just abusive for the sake of being abusive um and just verbally abuse you and things like that where you know even people who have I've, everybody i've talked to who's worked with jim has a reverence for him even though they might have been abused. They might have been yelled at. They might have been uh, pushed beyond their limits, beyond their comfort zone. That's what someone like Jim does. Exactly. And that's exactly what he did. He wrote me a reference letter, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. And he, he mentions, he's like, listen, I ask the best from everyone. And if you aren't, aren't up to it, then go somewhere else and find another job. But if you are, then let's do this. You know, there was a production meeting we had where, um, Jim was really angry about some, you know, something that didn't happen. And uh, I did it. You know, I, I messed up a schedule or I messed up something that we were doing. And in the production meeting, all the departments are there. Jim wants to know, he's pounding on the desk going, who did this? I want to know. You, know, I need someone to take responsibility. And I literally raised my hand and said, that was me. And then he looks at me and goes, tell me why. So I told him, I said, listen, I did this. I did this. We didn't, you know. Whatever the explanation was, I don't remember it. And he looks at me in front of the entire group and he says, is that ever going to happen again? And I said, no, Jim, because now I understand what you were doing and I understand why that happened. So I'm going to fix that. And he looks around at the room and he says, I want everybody to understand this. I'm very angry at him, but he's going to deal with it. If you can all do that, we will do this well. That's that's fascinating. Did you ever hear the um I had Russell on the show years ago. Uh did you ever hear the story of how he got hooked up with Jim? I did not. I'll tell you the story real quick for a lot of people who haven't heard that episode because it's one of my favorite Jim Garman stories. It, um Russell gets a call from his agent and he goes, Hey, uh uh Jim Cameron wants to talk to you about um his next project. And he's like, Okay. So he goes down to Malibu, goes into the into his compound and Jim he meets Jim and he, and Jim just starts talking to Russell like he has a job. There's no, there's just, it's like, okay, so we're going to start doing this. And, we're, and he walked and Russell, very similar to you in France. <laughs> like, I don't, am, am I, am I, what am I doing? So he leaves, he calls his agent and goes, I think, I think I was hired on True Lies. I don't, I think he, he goes, no, no, you're starting. You're starting in like two days or something like that. And, and this is happening. 
So he goes to he goes and and, and I don't know if you have you ever met Russell? No, I haven't. No. Russell's the sweetest, kindest, gentlest soul. Like he's a very just a gentle person. Uh, which is so interesting to work with someone like Jim and him being so as a, such a close uh, proximity as a DP. And uh, they start shooting for a couple of days and no problems. Jim is a sweetheart to him, just an absolute. And he calls his wife up. He goes, I don't understand. I mean, I mean, I mean, I, yeah, I see him get upset with people on set, but he doesn't have any problems with me. So I guess everything's fine. So they're back at his, uh, the screening room in Malibu in his house and they're doing dailies. And, uh, all of a sudden, a shot of Arnold comes up, and it's 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 Russell, uh, the production designer, the first AD, and I think the production manager or the producer or something like that's in the room, and he goes, "What the fuck is that?" <laughs> it's loud as, and Russell's like, "Oh my god!" He goes, "Hey Russell, uh, it'd be nice uh, if I could see the biggest movie star in the world that I just paid twenty million dollars to. His face would be nice if I could see it." And Russell just starts to crawl into a ball and like, to, and then next shot, boom, hits him again. Next shot, boom, hits him again. And Russell just goes, uh, he just walks out, like walks out into the parking lot. He's like, I'm fired, I'm fired, fired off the thing. Calls his wife and he's just like, I'm fired, I'm fired off this. I can't, this is obviously it's not working. The first AD and the production designer run back out and he goes, Russell, don't worry about it. It's fine. He goes, what do you, what do you mean? He goes, he does that to every DP. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, call every other DP he's ever worked with up and find out. So he calls up the guy from, I think, the Abyss or Terminator 2 or something like that. And he goes, what? What? He goes, did he did he say about the whole, I wish I could see the light of the face of the biggest movie star in the world? Yeah, he does that to everybody. <laughs> and that, and I was, it's just a way to push. I think it's just yeah. a way to like make sure he gets what he wants out of it. It's, it's, he's a fascinating character study as a character. Jim Cameron is a fascinating oh, yeah. character. Fascinating, fascinating character character study. I'd be interested if I could ever get uh, if I could ever get him on the show. Hopefully, maybe this year. Uh, I almost had him once. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> almost, by the way, almost had him for his book. Uh, tech, oh. I have it right there. Tech Nor. Yeah. Uh, that Jim had. It's very close, but eh, you never know. Uh, Where do things have happened in this world? <laughs> True that. <laughs> So, all right. So what, uh, so you're now down in Austin. What are you working? Are you working on a very special project down here Yeah, in yes. Texas? Tell us, tell everybody what you're trying to help us do here, man. Good to Texas. So um, moved here January. Um, I do a lot of uh, budgets and schedules and business proposals and decks for feature films shooting everywhere. Um, I got hired to do a, a budget and a schedule for a small Western film, about $8 million Western film, all about Texas, early 1800s. Um, and I started doing research and called the film commission and said, Hey, you know, I'm doing this budget. I'd like to get an understanding of your tax incentives. And she's uh, the film commission said, Oh, we've run out of money. I said, what do you mean? Well, we have a two year program. It's $45 million grant. And we ran out of money in the first three months of the first year of the two year program. And I said, that sucks. I said, well, I have this little eight million dollar movie that our finance company, the ca the capital company, won't do unless we get tax credits. Just shrug their shoulders and go, yeah, sorry. So um, we're shooting in Oklahoma. We're shooting a movie about Texas in Oklahoma because Oklahoma has much better tax uh, incentives than than Texas does. I mean, shit. To be honest. 12 other states have better tax incentives than Texas, maybe even more. So um, that kind of triggered me to a point where I'm like, I just moved here. I moved to Texas from Los Angeles. And this is really going to limit the kind of work I can do here in, in around my home. You know, I'm in Austin. I thought Austin was like the hub of this stuff. So um, I did some more research and then uh, realized that I'm just going to write a bill. So we are currently, I created an organization called the Texas Media Coalition. Um, and I got a whole a group of friends, my business partner, Robert Hansen. We do a podcast as well, actually, called The Arsenic mm -hmm. Show. Mm -hmm. So I'm producing that out of my house. Um, so Robert introduced me to his friends, and then his friends introduced me to other friends. And then I started talking a little bit about, like, listen, wh why don't we just write a new bill? So uh, over the last six months, um, I took about seven different states in the U.S. 
did side by side comparisons to all of the uh, of their incentives, and then started pulling and picking and choosing things that might work for Texas. So, and then uh, I talked to Media Services, a gentleman named Ryan over at Media Services. He started giving me a lot of information. Chris, you should try this. Chris, you should try that because he runs all the the uh, tax credit program around the country for Media Services. Um, one of my dear friends is Kevin Beggs, who is the uh, chairman of Lionsgate Television. I wrote to Kevin. I said, Kev, I'm trying to do this new bill for Texas. He said, well, you should, I'll hook you up with Jimmy Barge, who's the CFO of Lionsgate. So right now, Lionsgate, I'm using their entire team as going over my whole bill to make sure it fits whatever the studios are looking for. So we are now at the point where the bill has been written. I met with the Texas Film Commission a week ago. They love it. They said it was the best program they've seen in years. Makes sense. Concise. Has everything. She gave me some, uh, Stephanie Welling gave me some notes. I in integrated the notes, sent it back to them. They're reviewing it now. I have uh, two sets of lobbyists. I have a tax expert for the state. Um, we are meeting with uh, Representative Todd Hunter next week to talk to him about sponsoring the bill. Uh, along with the bill, we have something called the uh, the media trainee program. So um, Ireland, I, I, I did a movie called The Green Knight. I was a production executive um, handling all the money and the finance, making sure the producers did what they had to do correctly. Um, in Ireland, they have a trainee program I'm trying to model. So it's like a two to three day boot camp where they just they send PAs out and they teach them pretty much the basics of what it's like to work on a set. Our program, three day boot camp. <laughs> is going to teach you not how to make a movie, but how to work on one. Mm. And that's a much different experience because they, you know a lot of people go to the film school to, to learn how to make a movie or a TV show or a pilot or write this or write that or produce that or edit that or direct right. that. Our program is meant like, we're going to start with accounting 101, how to fill out paperwork. You know? I'm sexy. Sexy. I, we, took, we stripped the glitz and glamour right out of the program. <laughs> and it basically is just walking around set what to say what not to say don't act like an idiot you know but mm -hmm. we, it's a very concise three-day program that we are including with the bill so in order for uh the productions that come in they have to abide by the bill now the difference about this bill is that we are not currently touching the 45 million dollar grant that texas has we are not touching that we're doing a two-tier system Anything 15 million and above will flip over to us. Anything 15 million and below will stay with the grant system. That way, that 45 million or maybe even 90, I think the, there's a group called the TXMPA. They're trying to make it 90 million. So if they can succeed, then that 90 million will last the entire two years for anything 15 million and, above, and below. 50 million and above, we're looking at Disney, we're looking at Apple, we're looking at Netflix. We're looking at Warner Brothers, Sony. We're looking at the studios. We want them to come here. We have a 5% um, bump for television series. Not films, television series. Because that television series, yes. as you know, they'll keep generating the jobs. It, you know, you get a 10-episode, 12-episode order that lasts for a year. Then you get a reorder. That's another year. Then in season two, three, another year. So we threw in an extra, extra money for the uh, TV guys. Um, That's awesome. So all of this will build the base for Texas in order to build the foundation and have them create uh, more of a global market. Uh, we are. I'm also partnering with uh, Producers Without Borders. That's a group uh, that sprung out of the PGA. I'm a member of the Producers Guild. 25 years this year, nice. and uh, they, you know, they sprung out in order to bring um, producers from all around the world together. So like if, if somebody in Italy needs help producing an underwater documentary, they'll call me because I'm a member of Producers Without Borders and that's how it all works. So we're, the Texas Media Coalition is partnering with Producers Without Borders to make Texas a more of a global hub for media production. That's the idea. And we're going to continue these uh, relationships. I met with the Houston Film Commission. Houston's on board. I'm going to go there and lecture. I'm going to do a bunch of classes for Houston. Nice. I want to do the same for Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, you name it. This is a, a Texas initiative, not just an Austin initiative. It's a Texas initiative. That's what I've been doing for the last, you know, I don't know eight months now. That's amazing. Well, first of all, I appreciate you doing that, sir, because as I as a as a production professional who just moved here as well, 
that's helpful uh to say the least and uh man thank you i appreciate you doing that so let's see what happens because i always wondered that look i'm from florida and we used to have a decent one in there and they well, florida is doing a new one i don't know if you've heard the latest but uh there there are some gentlemen down there that are trying to do exactly what i'm doing for state of texas but in florida so um, I mean, i'm going to have a call with them next week and see if i can help them with florida yeah because georgia just took everything Georgia, so Georgia is estimating 4.4 billion in revenue out of production. California is 2.9, so that'll give you an idea what Georgia's doing. Jesus, really? Yeah. I mean, they just went all in. They went all in, and now they have the infrastructures in there. They have crew. They got. I mean, it's all there now. All there, yeah. But what we're trying to do is going. We're going to be all there eventually, but we just need to get through the legislature and. You know, a lot of people, uh, people, a lot of the politicians here in Texas that are very conservative think Hollywood is a bunch of, you know, you know, dem libs, you know, mm -hmm. that are far left wing, you know, mm -hmm. crazy Hollywood, blah, blah. You know what? They're not. You know, there are a lot of people that are working stiffs. You know, I, I'm a line producer. So below the line, there are a hell of a lot more below the line than there are above the line. Mm -hmm. So, you know, think of all the special effects, the wardrobe, the grip, electric, oh, no, everybody, camera, yeah. everybody. everybody. Post, so, everything, yeah. you know, and so what we're trying to do also uh, with the Texas Media Coalition is to educate the politicians to say, this is, I'm calling it media manufacturing sector, because that's what we do. I mean, we, we, we don't make an iPhone, but our form of what we do make is $25 and you can go see it at the theater. OK, mm -hmm. or it's one hundred dollars and you pay to a streaming service. That's what we make. So we make stuff. We make something. So if the politicians can understand we are a manufacturing sector, they might actually grasp the idea of all the jobs it creates and all the revenue it creates and et cetera, et cetera. That's awesome, man. I, I man, I, congrats, sir. Congrats. Uh, and I and wish that, you yeah, let's wait, wait till next year. Let's see how it hey, turns out. <laughs> I wish you nothing but the best, my friend. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Ask all my guests. What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Um, well, be nice to everyone. <laughs> Literally. Because you never know that person, you know, that you meet is going to uh, where they're going to be in 10 years, five years. You know, they may be, you may be working with someone that's your PA, treat them well, treat them with respect, dignity. And because someday that PA is going to be the chairman of Lionsgate television. Kevin and I both met, he was the assistant to Doug Schwartz at Burke Schwartz Bonham, who did fortune hunt and do did steel chariots and do Baywatch. So Kevin Beggs, who is now chairman, was the assistant to Doug, and he was a school teacher before that. You never know where people are going to go and what they're going to do. So it, my my best ex best advice is to always be nice and respectful to everyone, no matter you know what position they are. Don't don't be walked on. Don't be a rug. You, know, you don't want to be a mat. But you just have to respect everyone. And the other thing, the other piece of advice is network. Because mm -hmm. I tell newbie, I tell new people that get in, all you need is one job. If you get that one job and you do the right networking, some excuse me, somebody from that job will get you another job, then another job, then another job, and another job, and another job. Be friendly, be nice, be good. You know, don't talk shit about anybody. Try to avoid all the political traps that fall with human beings. Doesn't matter if you're in production or whatever industry you're in. Who cares? And believe it or not, you'll find your way. You will. Yeah, and I always, uh, I, when people ask me that question, I always like, just don't be a dick. Don't be a dick. Yeah. Don't perfect. be. It's the best advice ever. Just don't yeah. be a dick, because people um, don't yeah. want. I don't care how talented you are. Nobody wants to work with a yeah. dick. Can I? I want to share. I want to share one yeah. quick story. Um, yeah, you yeah. had said to me in the beginning of this, Chris, you did wardrobe, you did effects, you did, you worked in all these jobs. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you why. And this is the third piece of advice I will give to everyone. So um, while I was at Disney, I was I was doing craft service for a good two years. The Muppets were coming to town. And Jim Henson uh, was making a deal with Michael Eisner. Mm -hmm. So they were doing a TV show called The Muppets of Walt Disney World. Um, I told my bosses at Disney I, at the studio, I said, I need to work on The Muppet Show. I grew up with The Muppets. I watched them every day after school. Miss Piggy, Kermit, the whole thing. It was just like it was ingrained in me. I need to work on that show. 
So uh, Matt Seitz, who was uh, my studio boss then, he said, well, Chris, I'm going to have you interview with Martin Baker. Martin is Jim Henson's producer. You'll be the first one. See how you do. I said, okay, great. So I went in uh, and I met with Martin Baker. He's a British man, lovely. One of the he changed my life. Let's put it that way. So um, I tell Martin, I'm, I'm like a little jumping bee. I'm excited. I say, I love the Muppets. I want to do this. I've been doing craft service, but I really don't want to do craft service anymore. I've been watching what everybody does on set. And then Martin says to me, Chris, where do you set yourself in the next 10 years? And I looked at him and I didn't have an answer. So I answered honestly. I said, Martin, I've been only doing craft service for two years. Honestly, I really don't know. I would like more experience to try to figure that out, but I don't know. And he says, well, that's a good answer, Chris. That's, that's, that's a truthful answer. So listen, we have 10 weeks of production. I need to hire a lot of locals. So I would like to hire you as a floater PA. Now, I didn't know what that was until he said, the floater PA is going to work a week, one week in every single department on this production, because we're, I'm going to have like five of you guys that are just going to be floating around. Wherever we need help, we're going to send you over to that department. I said, okay, great, whatever you want. Florida is a right to work state. So even though it was a union production, we were still allowed to do that. So um, Martin, for 10 weeks, I wor worked one week in the production office, one week in the camera department, you know, camera batteries, I, a backpack with camera batteries. I was in the grip department. Just all I was doing was loading cable into the truck back and forth. That's it. Uh, I worked in, you know, um, grip. I worked in, I worked in all the departments, 10 different departments during a 10 week production. So the production's over. By the way, Jim Henson, unbelievable. One of the, you know. Oh, you it, met Jim? You met Jim? I worked with Jim Henson oh directly. Oh, God. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that I was the other that. famous Jim I worked with. Yeah, yeah. Holy, what was Jim? Okay, Jesus, Jim. I mean, Jesus Christ. Uh, how did, uh, what was it like working with Jim Henson, man? So if you can imagine a, a spiritual guru of some sort, Jim Henson had an aura about him. He would, you know, we had one, we had one production meeting where every, all the department heads don't have enough money, don't have enough time. I mean, it's TV and it was, you know, whatever. So they're all yelling at each other and Jim Henson walks in the room and he literally just walks in and he has a very pleasant smile, very tall man. Um, and he walks in and everybody just kind of just calms down and, and you can feel the presence of this person. And he just looks at around to everyone and goes, I know we're having some issues on scheduling and budgeting and time, but what I would like to know from all of you is what would you like to have for lunch today? And everybody just starts laughing and just said, you know, because what Jim did was he said, listen, we're going to get this done that, you know, I have no qualms about that. But what I'd like to know is what do you want to have for lunch? I mean, it really, it just, it put things in perspective. So he had this whole, this aura about him that was the most, you know, zen that you could ever meet in your entire life. And that's what I miss, uh, you know, about working with other people. So um, anyway, go back to Martin. So I'm sitting on the couch and I'm so excited. Martin gives me that job. I work in all these departments. The end of the show, I take uh, the director and Jim Henson to the airport. I drive them in the van to the airport. And I go back, Martin says, well, Chris, uh, you're, you're done tomorrow. It's your last day. I've heard wonderful things about you. So what do you want to do? I mean, now that you got to see everything, what do you want to do? What do you think? So I look at Martin and as serious as I can, as serious as I am, I say to Martin, Martin, I want to do what you do. And he looks at me quizzically and says, but Chris, we never spent any time together. We never, you don't know what I do. I mean, I interviewed you and then sent you on your way. I said, Martin, you don't understand. Anyone that has the power to give a kid like me the break you gave, that's what I want to do. And he sat back in his chair. He was like, interesting. And he says, I'm going to give you an assignment, Chris. For the next 10 years of your life, I want you to do exactly what you did on this production on every other production you can find. I want you to work wardrobe on a TV show. I want you to work special effects on a movie. I want you to work um, locations on a commercial. I want you to do every single de art department. I want you to do art, art department on Fortune Hunter, you know, on a series. I want you to do this, 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 and this, because I didn't go to film school. I didn't really have the overall knowledge that maybe some kids out of film school do. 
But what I knew was I loved this business and I wanted to do as much in it as I possibly could. So um, for the next 10 years, you look at my resume, you look at my IMDb page, you'll see the things I did. I was on, I did special effects on the movie, The Crow. I was there when Brandon was killed. That's another podcast for another day. It was no, I had a Alex. I had Alex. I had Alex on the show. He's Alex Price. Yeah. Oh man. yeah, I even had Alex twice on the show. He's he's we we talked about it for about four or five minutes. It's not something he likes to talk about. It's but not he, something I like to talk about. Yeah, no. exactly. exactly. But you know, in special effects, my job, I had a sledgehammer, and my job was to walk up and down the hose lines. We were shooting in North Carolina in February, March. It was freezing weather, and I had to break the ice in the hose lines in order for when Alex yelled action, we would have rain. That was my only job. Jeez. I've worked in special effects. Yeah, no, I saw, I saw that. I saw, yeah, you, you've worked on a bunch of different yeah. projects and so, you did a bunch yeah, of different. My things. advice to filmmakers, young and old, whatever, do as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And until you find the direction and the path you want to go in. After I spent that 10 years, I realized that it was truly Martin, what he did is what I wanted to do. So I went and started moving towards producing, line producing, uh, executive producing, whatever, you know, whatever I could do. Never really wanted to direct, never really, you know, I wrote a couple of scripts. I actually won an award for a script, but I don't, I'm not going to say I am a writer because I am not, because I don't focus on that, but I am a producer. And that is what I'd love to do. And that's where my passion is. And the advice I give to anyone is, you know, if you're a producer, you better have experience in pretty much all the other areas to be the better producer. Uh, and I'm going to just ask you one more question, sir. Three of your favorite films of all time. Oh boy. Jeez. I, as of I, right I, now, as of right now, I'm a genre guy. So yeah. for me, uh, you know, James Bond, Sean Connery and Daniel Craig are my two favorites. So James Bond, um, I grew up with Spielberg and Lucas. So star Wars, Indiana Jones, uh, action adventure type stuff. Um, and then I'll put James Cameron on number three on that one. Any of the gym films, Terminators, The Abyss, Titanic, True Avatar, Lies. True Lies. Eh, not so much True Lies, but I you know. I love True Lies. What are you talking about? I'm not going to put that as one of my favorites. No, but, you know, but it's fun. It was a fun It's movie. fun. Sure, sure. Um, no, but it's not up there with Abyss. It's not up there Terminator, with, with, with Terminator the other 2. ones. Yeah, with, yeah, with the other ones, you know. So, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a genre kind of guy. And I'm a big budget guy, too. So, I, you know, independent, I give all the all the credit in the world to the independents, man. Those are the, the low budget movies are the hardest ones to work on. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because when you have money, you can pretty much solve whatever the problem is you're trying to deal with. But when you're trying to creatively figure out how to do this one shot and you can't afford it, that's that's when the business gets uh, tricky. Chris, man, it has been a pleasure talking to you, my friend. I can't believe I found a a fortune hunter alum on uh, in my journeys in life. But uh, but man, I I appreciate you, brother, and thank you for all the hard work you're doing here in Texas and and teaching and, and sharing your knowledge with everybody. And hopefully some of these stories that are not just entertaining, but hopefully they picked up a couple of things to help them along their path. I hope so. Listen, uh, I'd love to, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me. I have my own website, Chris mm -hmm. uh, civilized entertainment. It's my production company. So you can email me through civilized, you know, at Gmail uh, and then our snake show. We also have our own you know website for that. You can email through that. Yeah, we'll oh, put, yeah, I'll put all those links in the show notes. But yeah. Chris, man, I appreciate you, brother. Thanks again for coming on the show. You're welcome, uh, Alex. It's been a pleasure, and I, I love talking about this stuff, as you can imagine.